According to the peace agreement signed at the White House between the PLO and Israel, Israeli troops are slated to begin pulling out of the West Bank town of Jericho next week. The European Parliament has 518 members, representing the 12 member nations of the European Community. The Parliament divides its work between Strasbourg, Luxembourg City, and Brussels. In 1992, 336,663 persons emigrated to California. Immigration, who belongs, who decides, is the focus of the first national student town meeting, bringing immigrants, policymakers, and teenagers from the Los Angeles area together. They'll examine the issues and explore the answers Friday, beginning at 8 p.m. and Sunday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time on C-SPAN. Up next, a special on South Africa's new constitution. On Thursday, November 18th in Johannesburg, South Africa's white minority government and black political leaders approved a new constitution. For the next 90 minutes, we'll take a look at the content of this new constitution, which is now before the South African Parliament for ratification. Our guests are South African Ambassador to the U.S., Harry Schwartz, Dr. Baldwin Gubaine, Health Minister, and member of the Encanta Freedom Party's Executive Committee, Peter Mulder of the Afrikaner Party, and member of the South African Constitution Negotiation Team, and Bulelani Noka of the African National Congress, and member of the Constitution Negotiation Team. This roundtable was followed by President F.W. de Klerk's November 22nd speech dealing with the new Constitution, and a Q&A session with members of the South African Parliament. This new constitution includes South Africa's first Bill of Rights and guidelines for eliminating all remnants of apartheid. If ratified, it will clear the way for the first multiracial elections on April 27. Dr. Baldwin Gubani, Minister of Health for South Africa, why is your country developing a new constitution? Because we had to make a transition from an unrepresentative type of government to a democratic constitutional government. How is the process working? Well, the process has not been very satisfactory in that it is not all-inclusive. It has tended to alienate some major parties, and it has proceeded without consensus being developed to a conclusion. What consensus do you want? Consensus about the form of state and the type of governance that we shall have. We are not satisfied with the two-phase process. We believe that we must define the form of state, write the constitution, and elect a government to rule South Africa. Ambassador Harry Schwar is uh, ambassador from South Africa to the U.S. What will be contained in this new constitution? Well, the new constitution is really an interim constitution which is designed to operate uh, while a final constitution is being drawn. Uh, it will contain the provisions of a Bill of Rights. Uh, it will contain the provisions relating to a universal franchise election. Uh, it will uh, create a constituent assembly. Uh, it will create regional forms of government, uh, some nine regions, in order to have that government at that level, which would perhaps be equivalent to state government here. And generally, it deals with uh, what is necessary to govern a country. I think the essential point is that until now, South Africa has had a parliamentary system in which parliament has been supreme. What is now intended to do is to have a constitution which will be supreme, and the legislature will be subject to the constitution. Dr. Gavani expressed some concerns about the process. Your reaction? Well, I think that uh, we would be much happier, and I think when I say we, many people in South Africa would be happier if everybody was in the process. And it is to be regretted that uh, there are a number of parties of which uh, my colleague's party is one, which is not inside the process, because obviously uh, to achieve... This transformation, Mr. Speaker, from parliamentary sovereignty to the sovereignty of law, to constitutionality is far-reaching. It is significant for every individual, language group, organization, and political party. 
It offers healthy protection to all. It changes the essence and character of our state. It places an effective limitation on the abuse of power by any majority, however it is composed. It replaces, Mr. Speaker, power, it replaces power as the determining factor with values which define justice as the decisive test and determining factor of the future. Henceforth, Mr. Speaker, no government will be able to do just as it pleases merely because it has a majority. One day, when the history of this era is written, this incisive change in our system will stand out as the most significant constitutional innovation of them all. For that reason, yes, but we still keep making history. We still keep making history because this country is a forward-looking country, sir. And we'll take you along in the final analysis. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, for that reason, my plea is that all South Africans should adopt this new, this new constitutional approach, this new personality of our country as their own. We have to stop believing that political power is everything. In the future, it will be limited. Question number two. Will the new constitution bring about a federal dispensation? Strong and entrenched regional governments with meaningful powers and functions. Yes or no? Yesterday's report says yes. The Sunday Times sometimes say no on one page and perhaps on another. Academics and political parties differ sharply on this question. Other speakers on this side of the house, sir, will expand in greater detail on this controversy. To start with, I merely wish to underline a few points of view in this regard. Mr. Speaker, a debate on legal technicalities with regard to the question of whether this is a federal system now or not will not get us anywhere. The key question is not about which definition of which academic commentator or politician is preferred. The question is about whether the new constitution will provide an effective balance of power between the provinces, the constituent states on the one hand, and the central government on the other. Will there be effective devolution of meaningful powers and functions to the provinces? Will strong regional governments be possible and will they enjoy adequate protection? Those are really the fundamental questions which we must ask. We must divorce this debate from legal technicalities and academic arguments and ask whether this system has the necessary balance of power between centrality on the one hand and devolution on the other hand. Sir, so my response is an unequivocal yes to these questions. The new constitution contains. He would for Slovo groet to say, "Jelle praat mos nou met hulle." Member must send greetings to Mr. Slovo as the member is also speaking to him. Order. The new constitution, Mr. Speaker. The new constitution contains a whole series of stipulations, which will remove any reasonable doubts about these questions if they are read together and interpreted correctly. I wish to name but a few. Firstly, sir, the wide range of powers and functions, which sex section uh, clause 118, read together with schedule six, confers on the provinces, is far more comprehensive than is frequently made out. I know there's an argument about the concept of concurrent power. But, sir, the definition of the concurrency as contained in 118 clearly limits the scope of instances when central legislation will have greater power than provincial legislation. It limits it to five, near, near to five speaker, exceptions. Mr. Speaker, order, order. 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 speaker, also Mr. speaker the point of order. Order. Uh, with respect to the process. There are no the no 
Your line involved in debate relating to the negotiations process. The Honourable State President now is quoting from the draft constitution which the Honourable Members do not have access to, with the result that they cannot partake in this debate to deal with the State President's statements, because that draft constitution has not been tabled yet. I would like to tell the member this is a joint session of parliament where the state president makes his speech and just thereafter members will be given an opportunity to also partake. Mr. Speaker, can I just in the first instance, instance say that if the honourable members were present at Kempton Park they would have received it as I did. But, sir, in any event, they get all the parts that are produced there. They are on the distribution list. So, and if the internal distribution of documents is not good enough, they must not direct the accusations at me. Of the exceptions, where it is clearly stated that only when those exceptions apply will central legislation prevail over regional legislation. So each one of those exceptions will be justiciable. In each one of those exceptions, there are built-in norms and definitions. And if the central government would encroach upon the areas of authority given to provinces in terms of Clause 118, and if they were to go beyond those objective norms built into those five exceptions, they will be justiciable and any province or all the provinces could take such legislation to the constitutional court and it will be declared null and void. I therefore say, sir, that this is not interpreted correctly and that there is a fixation on the word original powers as opposed to concurrent as if what is now given does not afford provinces the opportunity to outside those exceptions, take all the power with regard to those powers and functions identified. Secondly, sir, the powers of taxation of provinces and the prescriptions for the distribution of personal taxes and value-added tax are also greater than some would have heard. Sir, people forget that in this same document, a financial and fiscal commission will be called into being. On which, sir, nine out of the ordinary 16 members will be appointed by the provinces themselves. And this, this, sir, financial and fiscal commission will have strong powers, sir. It will have strong powers and it will have a determining influence. Furthermore, sir, there will be a special role for the Senate. The Senate will be the watchdogs over the interests of the provinces. And there will be equal representation, sir, irrespective of the number of residents in each of the provinces, ten from each region. And, sir, that Senate, elected by the provincial legislature, will have to adopt in future any parts of a new constitution which might affect the powers, the functions, or the boundaries of regions with its own two-thirds majority. So the binding principles which deal with provincial government under the revised final constitution, part of this first constitution, are also stronger than opponents are prepared to admit. I submit that they create a clear framework which apart from also certain restrictions confirm the autonomy of the provinces and their claim to exclusive as well as concurrent powers. It is clearly stated there. The sum total, Mr. Speaker, of this is a package of measures which provide adequate security for all, and that includes the National Party, for all who are concerned about strong regional government on a federal basis. It will not satisfy people who are demanding a disguised confederation in the name of federalism. And there are such people. I agree with them. This is not a sort of a, a, an under-the-table 
form of bringing confederalism into the system. It brings about a fair form of federalism for this country, which if used correctly, offers sir, that which everyone who supports federalism wants to happen in this country. The third question, sir, order, who order. was the winner? Excuse me, Mr. President. Achbarlet for Hercules. The member for Hercules. Achbarlet, me dadelijk terugtrek wat ik gezegd. You must withdraw his comment immediately. Achbarlet, me terugtrek. Achbarlet, me terugtrek. You must withdraw it. Excuse me, Mr. President. Excuse me, Mr. State President. Hij ook geval, meneer die speaker die. Anyway, Mr. Speaker, the interjection relates to an issue at which the Honourable Member is quite an expert. Mr. Speaker, order. The third question is who was the winner in the negotiation process? About this, sir, a great deal is being said. Complete key conflicting analysis are being made. Some maintain that the National Party has capitulated on most of the important issues. So I say that is the biggest nonsense I've heard in a long time. Anyone who says that is either uninformed or malicious. Mr. Speaker, an objective analysis of all National Party policy papers right from four years ago and of my statements and the statements of other leaders, especially those made during the referendum, will show beyond any doubt that we have essentially succeeded in our aims. In respect of every fundamental issue or point of departure which we have stated, we have succeeded in getting it accommodated in the new Constitution and Bill of Rights. We stayed, Mr. Speaker, within our mandate and we are generally satisfied with the result. Of course, yes, like an independent judiciary. So, but who proposed? Who proposed the Judicial Service Commission? Who proposed the Judicial Service Commission? We did, sir. We developed it. The Honourable Let us not catch flies of each other. And Weinberg. I publicly thank, sir, your Honourable Leader, for the constructive role he played in bringing also the question of the composition of the Constitutional Court to a satisfactory solution. And he has publicly thanked me for the role that I've played, sir. He phoned me and we had a discussion on it and it worked. we worked together in that. It does not behoove that honorable member to, to, to go to that level to try and catch flies on this. Or, uh, Mr. Speaker, I say, we stayed within our mandate and we are generally satisfied with the result. Of course, we also had to make concessions. None of them, however, entailed any surrender of the heart or the principles on which we based our approach. Mr. Speaker, when I say that, it does not only apply to the agreed constitutional provisions, but also to the process and the process ahead. It was the National Party government that took the initiative in respect of what is now referred to as the two-phase process. Already at Codesa 1, I suggested it. The same applies, sir, to the concept of a multi-party transitional government, which has now become known as a multi-party government of national unity. Overall, therefore, the National Party is convinced that we have succeeded not only in realizing our goals, but also in committing most of the other parties, juridically and emotionally, to a fair and reasonable constitution, to a balanced constitution, to a constitution able to serve South Africa well in spite of its shortcomings. No party has won. South Africa and all its people will indeed be able to win if they make the best of the opportunities the Constitution has to offer. Without the Constitution, all of us would have been losers. Now, everyone can become a winner. Mr. Speaker, there are certainly many other questions in the hearts of many voters. Time does not permit me to go into them more fully here today. I hope that the debate over the next three days, to which I shall reply towards the end, will contribute towards allaying unnecessary fears and to clearing up of confusion. 
I hope especially that all South Africans will now bury the hatchets, will abide by the rules of the game, and will begin to concentrate on the game itself. That game, sir, is the coming election. Mr. Voorradek, Sir, before I say anything about the forthcoming election, I would like to return to the Freedom Alliance. Mr. Speaker, the government is still involved in attempts to bring the parties within the alliance on board by means of negotiation. Given a true disposition towards a settlement and a spirit of haste on the side of the Freedom Alliance, it remains possible. Agreements, Mr. Speaker, which will take place within the next week perhaps a few days longer, will be achieved. Agreements which also have to include the negotiation council of the multi-party forum can still be ratified by the parliament. There is still time. The government team, Mr. Speaker, stands ready to conduct further negotiations tomorrow, aided by documents which have been exchanged and are in the process of being exchanged. We believe, sir, that we have already made constructive proposals and we are prepared to look with the Freedom Alliance at what can still be done without breaking down or destroying the essence and character of that which has already been achieved. So the basis of the present negotiations with the Freedom Alliance is that federalism is accepted as a point of departure. The question in negotiations is how federalism can be strengthened. This statement that I have now made was confirmed against me on two occasions last Friday by leaders of the Freedom Alliance. If this is not so, negotiations would be senseless. That, so in itself is progress. The Conservative Party and Afrikaner Volksfront, therefore, now are also negotiating within the framework of federalism. That, sir, that which they previously rejected is totally unacceptable. Sir, it is also progress. The AVF is also negotiating with the ANC. The National Party was attacked for being sellouts for the same reason. It is also progress, Mr. Speaker, if it is true that the Conservative Party and Afrikaner Volksfront are within a state, within a province which they view as an answer to their striving for a nation state. It is also progress if it is true that they within that state will give voting rights to blacks, coloreds and Indians. If it is true that they are prepared to subject themselves to such a state, bound by constitutional stipulations, which will prohibit any form of racial discrimination, then it is progress. We, sir, would very much like to hear from the Conservative Party in this debate whether it is all true. Do they now at least accept, as a point of departure, a federation? A simple question, sir, and I see, and I see the Honourable Member of the Conservative Party will be speaking just after myself. It needs only be a yes or a no. Do they accept as a point of de departure federation? Further, sir, are they prepared to provide the opportunity to all parties, including the ANC, to have candidates in the state which they demand? Further, sir, are they prepared to accept the result of such an election if the National Party or the ANC should win such an election in such a state? Sir? Further, would all the inhabitants of such a state be able to vote, whatever their race or colour? If their answer to this question is yes, then I say honestly and sincerely, sir, that I am profoundly grateful. Then I say there is hope. Then, sir, there is no need for war talk. Then we are near to each other. Sir, but if their answer is no, then I cannot understand how the IFP, President Mangopi, and the Siskai can stay any longer in the alliance with the Conservative Party and the AVF. Why do I say so, sir? If the Conservative Party rejects federalism, then it rejects the core of the Encarta Freedom Party's policy. 
And I asked the Honourable Member of Freyhe if I'm right when I say that the core of the Encarta Freedom Party's policy is federalism. And therefore, sir, if the Conservative Party says no, they do not stand for federalism. Then they reject the core of the IFP's policy. Secondly, sir, if the Conservative Party does not want to give voting rights to Zulus, Tswanas and other blacks in the area which they demand, then they are an apartheid party, sir. And then there cannot be talk of Dr. Butelezi or President Magopi being party to this. Can the IFP take it that there is a province that is Zulu because he is a Zulu? Even if he is born there, cannot vote. No, sir. They cannot take it. Sir, if the CP answers no on this question, then all the other parties, including the IFP, should have the unqualified resolve to distance themselves from the CP and its policy. If they don't do this, sir, then the Freedom Alliance will be branded as the epitome of opportunism. It is not just not good enough, just not good enough that the Freedom Alliance presents itself as a political entity and this suits it, but avoids the political differences within its ranks. It is not good enough that the IFP says, I count the CP's vote together with mine to show how strong I am, if the CP will not allow its people to vote. It is the high point of political opportunism. Therefore, the Freedom Alliance is only an alliance of that which it is against. And they are not an alliance, sir, which has a common vision of the future. Except, sir, if the CP this afternoon says yes on this question, then I say, welcome back in the new South Africa. Come, let us go together. Sir, I'm closing off. We stand on the eve of the election. I'm not now going to give an election speech. The National Party is going to fight this election with great responsibility. There is agreement that after the election there will be a government of national unity. We will be there. So will the ANC. Some other parties may also qualify. So we will fight the election in such a way that no punches will be pulled in terms of policy. Policy differences. And that no punches will be pulled. We will fight hard. But, sir, we will fight fairly. We will fight in such a way that when the fight is over, we can take hands in the best interest of all South Africans to find a way to make reconciliation a reality. Our challenge, sir, our challenge is to make reconciliation work, sir. And, yes, each and every party which qualifies will serve with us in that government if they so wish. Sir, we look forward to the future and say this coming election is not about the past. It is about the future. And we as a party are reaching out to that future. We look forward to the election with great expectations. I thank you. Our look at the constitutional debate taking place in South Africa continues with questions to President de Klerk from members of parliament. We now proceed to questions to the state president without notice. I put question number one, Mr. D. Curry, the honorable member for Pinial. I would like to know from the honorable the state president, whether in a federal or regional system of government, Voters should have the right to choose provincial governments according to their preferences. If so, why did neither the South African government nor the National Party support the Democratic Party in the negotiating council 
when it argued in favor of a separate ballot paper for the erection of regional governments? If not, why not? The Honorable the State President. Mr. Speaker, I am and the government and the National Party is basically in favor of the concept of a separate ballot for the provincial governments and legislatures on the one hand and the central parliament on the other hand. Fact of the matter is that in this first vote, we are dealing with, and this in the final event, persuaded us to make the concession, to make the concession, to deviate from that which we also believe would be best. We are dealing with millions of voters who will be voting for the first time. Evidence across Africa and elsewhere is that wherever you have a complicated voting system, you have millions of ballot papers which are filled in incorrectly. And, sir, so that was the main reason why, in the final analysis, we decided that this is a concession we could make. May I further add, sir, that there is no doubt that one of the powers of regions must be that in future they will conduct their own elections. This will be the one and only time during which, for the sake of practicality, because also of the, to avoid complexity, that we will have a situation where with one cross, people will simultaneously elect two legislatures, namely a central one and the one for the province in which they live. So the fact that complexity must be avoided is recognized by many other agreements to which the Democratic Party was part. Firstly, the way in which we'll vote. There won't be voters' lists. Anybody will be able to vote wherever he or she may be. There won't be any number on the ballot paper. There won't be any checklist against which the ballot paper is, is, is given out in the sense so that we can convince people that nobody will know how they voted because we're also fighting inflation, uh, 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 intimidation. <laughs> and we're fighting inflation of unnecessary votes, sir. So, really, this is a matter where, on preference, I would have preferred two ballot papers. But it is a practical matter, and although there are some disadvantages involved in the one ballot paper, I think there are also good arguments why, on a one-off basis, we should do it this way. The Honourable Member for Pinel. Mr. Chairman, arising from the State President's reply, the DP will continue its fight now to get that extra vote. Will he instruct these delegations to support a resolution to be proposed by the Democratic Party at the negotiating council of Campton Park, that the matter of one or two ballot papers be reconsidered. The Honourable the State President. Mr. Speaker, my understanding is that although very reluctantly, the Democratic Party agreed to the one ballot paper in the last minute. And so on that basis, they now want to revisit a matter on which they've agreed. They must realize, sir, that that can open a Pandora's box. Because each and every party will then say, I have three, three top priorities with which I'm not happy. Let's start the whole process all over again. And for that reason, sir, we are extremely reluctant to revisit things with regard to which there was general consensus, although reluctantly given, but there was general consensus. So in all probability we won't do it. If however, sir, the Democratic Party with its tremendous power can convince sir, all the other parties, we won't stand in the way of a move back to two ballot papers. <laughs> Order. 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 Vraag number two. Question number two. Dr. P. J. Stienkamp, the Honorable Member of Mstalazana. Mr. State President, there is much talk, writing, 
and speculation concerning the role, the outlook and position of the present civil servants in the new dispensation. When I speak of civil servants, my question also relates to members of the South African Defence Force and South African Police. These are qualified people who over decades kept the wheels in the land rolling. Now the question is, have provisions been made in the new constitutional dispensation? In other words, has the National Party also presented their interests, and if so, to what extent? Mr. Speaker, firstly the short answer is yes. We have fully achieved our goals concerning this issue. So I have a long while ago had two meetings with the whole top structure of the public sector. One in the south in Cape Town and one in the north in Pretoria. At that occasion I again had it reviewed the other day because I had to address a group from national intelligence at an end of year function as I am a minister. And I went over what they said more than a year ago as to what our aims were. And so everything that I said to the officials themselves is written in the constitution. So no official policeman or person in the service loses his job due to the new constitution. Secondly, they have absolute pension security it's built in. Thirdly, there may be no changes brought about concerning their terms of service. Fourthly, their retirement age may not be changed without their approval. Lastly, sir, if any disputes arise then, they must be referred to a judicial tribunal and it cannot be done arbitrar arbitrarily. Sir, so provision has been made for a concealed position such as the Auditor General, Attorney General, also the Commission for Administration as the watchdog of the interests of the civil servants. Lastly, sir, also within the provincial dispensation, there's also provision for own small state commissions. Commissions of administration for every administration, for every administration, for every province. And they, to a great extent, also have complete self-determination. They will definitely make their own appointments, which will go along with this. I'm therefore at ease in my mind, so that the officials, soldiers, police, everyone in the service for the public sector can be sure their security has been effectively attended to and they will not be discriminated against or victimized in any way whatsoever. Question number three, Mr. P. T. Stein from Winburg. Mr. Speaker, Mr. State President, some of us farmers, the South African Agricultural Union and also other landowners in our country are worried about their title deeds in the new South Africa. It is also alleged that the clauses which deal with property rights, the chapter on fundamental rights in the new proposed constitution, does not provide sufficient protection to owners of land or whatever in the country. Can you give us your comments, please? Mr. Speaker, at this moment, or later this afternoon, the Deputy Minister of Justice, the Deputy Minister of Agriculture, will hold discussions with the South African Agricultural Union. I received a letter which is referred to in this debate. This letter I immediately refer to the Department of Justice to follow up on. An answer was sent yesterday to the South Africa South African Agricultural Union, which backed up by the state's legal advisors, gives certain assurances and spells out certain standpoints as to why we are convinced that the legal deductions that are being made by the South African Agricultural Union are not correct and that there is no reason for fear, as has been mentioned by them in their arguments contained in the letter sent to me. Sir, what is now ensured is that proper property rights as contained in the Property rights are now a fundamental right as contained in the Bill of Rights. It may not be infringed upon except according to a law. Even if it is done, it can only be done for public purposes. It must either be compensation that is agreed upon or compensation paid by the 
a court of law. So it is precisely the same as our Expropri Expropriation Act always said. Now that the list of conditions is mentioned, so the legal opinions, the cross-check legal opinions which I reviewed, said the overriding concept which is stated in that stipulation, namely just and equ equitable compensation, is the overriding concept. All the other issues that were named are after all the information I received, and also through my own experience as a legal person, which our courts and the administration of ju justice throughout our history have given attention to, while taking into consideration the stipulation of compensation. So there was a time I myself advocated speaking for market values only. But do you know that sometimes, because of circumstances, the market value is lower than the buyer's original payment, and that the market value taken on its own works against the interest of the man that was dispossessed. For example, sir, where a squatter camp exists next to a farm, that farm's value depreciates. And if that farm is dispossessed in such a way as to erect official houses and to clear up unfavorable conditions, and a person only relies on the market value, then the owner can be strongly disadvantaged, and therefore it is good to build in a balance. I'm convinced that the title deeds are safe within the framework, that it is now more protected as there is a charter than it was under previous legislation until the present moment. I ask for question four. Mr. D. Nolte, the Honorable Member for Delmas. Mr. Speaker, through you to the State President, I would like to expand on the question that the Honorable Member of Winburg asked. I want to ask you if you have now guaranteed the title and deeds of the farmers. How are you going to guarantee this when you and the government and your party will not be governing the so-called New South Africa after the 22nd of April 1994? Mr. State President. Sir, no single party will govern this country after 27th of April 1994. The new constitution will determine that there will be a government of national unity. So, if the Conservative Party is as strong as it makes itself out to be, then they will obviously beat us. So, then they will be in a very strong position themselves. But I know that they know that this is just a heap of dust they are kicking up. They know, sir, that, that they are going to lose badly in that election. But they do not have to worry. We are going to be there. And we are going to be there. And it is our goal, sir, to be with the biggest percentage of the total vote of any party in the country. Sir, so there is no talk that there will be a result if the voters use their right minds. That there will be a result, sir, which will place any party in a position to do just as they like. With all the checks and balances that are necessary to prevent the abuse of power, if they are built into the new constitution, nobody will be able to tear it up and throw it into the wastebasket. Nobody can tear up the charter. Because, sir, we do not only rely on law, we rely, sir, on the many mechanisms which were created, which can maintain that law, and therefore, sir, the Honourable Member can sleep peacefully. We will look after his interests. You play scary, scary nicely. The bug scares the baby politics. The National Party will look after the interests of all sensible, balanced people in this country. So also the important ones, such as those members seated in the front benches. Mr. Speaker, with respect to the Honourable State President, he has now not convinced me at all, absolutely not at all. I further would like to know from the State President why you and the traders at the Negotiating Council agreed upon this property clause. And I refer to Article 28, Subsection 2 and 3. After a similar clause was proposed by the Technical Committee on 19th July 1993 and by the Chief Justice, the Bar Association of South Africa and the Association of Attorney, 
attorneys was rejected. If the Honorable State President can only allow me, then I would want to finally ask whether your decision, therefore, comes down to a breaking of the traditional legal approach in respect of what, of that, rather, which concerns land ownership. And further, that the total, total financial insecurity structure in South Africa has been given a devastating blow. On the last group of questions, the answer is no. This is just a CP propaganda. In these questions, in those questions, and it is actually really with the greatest respect, I do not like to be sharp. This is just a load of nonsense to say that the whole financial structure was given a final blow. It is absolute no nonsense. So this country's financial structure demands admiration throughout the world. So it re has received recognition from the international council halls at the IMF and the World Bank. We are going to acquire a lot of money from them because they rightly say the system is right, sir. So our economy started to grow. All economic indicators are positive. Interest rates decreased, inflation decreased, the gross national products increased, in the previous quarter. We had an 8% growth. All looks well and the honorable member tries to scare people. So the Chief Justice's objection at that time was based on a clause which since then changed markedly. So at that point in time, to the best of my knowledge, the question of corrective action was still mixed with the question of expropriation and how it should have taken place. And therefore, sir, and sup suppositions which were written therein, and since then there have been six, eight, or ten other versions which do not produce the same comments. To now speak of how something was in July, and to comment on what was produced there, and to compare it with the final product to show, sir, that the honorable member needs to do a whole lot of study before he understands what is going on here. The time for questions to the state president has now expired. Two years in the making, this new constitution includes the nation's first Bill of Rights and guidelines for eliminating all remnants of apartheid. If ratified, this constitution will clear the way for the first multiracial elections on April 27th.